Every day we experience so many different relationships with our families, parents, children, husbands and wives, with work colleagues or friends or just people we meet during the course of the day. Tension and breakdowns in our relationships is one of the biggest causes of stress and anxiety. And yet when we speak about experiencing the peace of God, we often miss this dimension. We think of our relationship with God or our own inner world, but not how we get on with other people. And yet that's a vital part of experiencing peace. We're exploring what Paul has to say about all this in Philippians 4 and the commands or ingredients that lead up to his famous promise that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And one of the things Paul focuses on is all about how we relate to other people. It's often skipped over and missed or misunderstood, but it comes in verse 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Relationships with other people were very much at the forefront of Paul's mind when he wrote his famous words on peace. Because the verses before them are all about a breakdown in the relationship between two of Paul's friends and co-workers, Euodia and Syntyche. He pleads with them to be of the same mind in the Lord and then asks another friend to help mediate. And that then seems to be the prompt for what he says in the verses that follow. And so we can be pretty sure that when he talks about the peace of God just a few verses later, our relationships are very much part of his thinking. Sadly, Euodia and Syntyche's situation also reminds us of how difficult and easily fractured our relationships with others can be, which may be why what Paul says here about relationships is one of the most challenging parts of his recipe for peace. At first glance, though, that command, let your gentleness be evident to all, isn't obviously about relationships. And that's because the English word gentleness is often understood more as describing a characteristic or aspect of our personality than how we relate to other people. If I'm honest, when I first read this, I struggled a bit. I'm loud, I talk too much, I can be expressive and a bit full on. Gentleness isn't really me. Does that mean I have to change? Do I need a personality transplant? Well, no, or not exactly. There are plenty of ways that I do need to change in response to this command, but becoming a different person isn't one of them. So what does this mean? Well, the Greek word Paul uses, epia case, is all about relationships with other peoples. One alternative translation is gentle forbearance. It's about doing what's right and fair for others, even if it means missing out yourself. The ancient philosopher Aristotle put it like this, someone who does what is equitable and who does not stand on their rights. The banqueting house is all that's left of one of London's greatest palaces, Whitehall. And it was built to showcase the strength of England's Stuart kings, sumptuous and grand in scale, it's all topped off by this magnificent painting by Rubens, showing the power and glory of King James I. And I'm here because in the ancient world, this is the sort of place where you'd talk of epia case. It was a word most often used of kings and gods, the great and powerful. And I think that's a clue to us about what this means for you and me. Because it's not a word of weakness. This isn't about capitulation or surrender or being overwhelmed by others, but about being so great that we can afford to be generous and forgiving to other people and let our own rights and interests slide because we have so much we can afford to. But that may not sound like your life. I know it doesn't feel like mine and it wouldn't have been an obvious description of the Philippian Christians either most of whom were closer to the bottom of society than the top. So how can Paul say this? 
Well, the answer comes in the next sentence. The Lord is near. And there's a beautiful ambiguity to those words and two possible meanings. The first is that God is here with us by his Holy Spirit. And the second is a reminder that Jesus will one day return. And both remind us of what we have in Jesus and point us to the fact that God is on our side. And that really does mean that we have infinite riches and strength, both here and now in our relationship with God and eternally in our hope in Jesus. We are in a position to show epiakes. There's a wonderful parable Jesus told, which really helps me to get my head around all this, particularly when it comes to a key element of what epiakes looks like in practice, which is forgiveness. It's the story of a king who forgives one of his servants an enormous debt, 10,000 talents. But the servant then immediately demands payment from someone else of a much smaller amount, a hundred denarii. He has him thrown in jail when he can't pay. The story finishes with the king saying to the first servant, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And he then actually throws him in jail. It's a powerful story, vividly showing us that Jesus expects and demands that we forgive others, even as he has forgiven us. But one thing that really hits me is the amounts of money involved. Unfortunately, for most of us these days, those amounts are fairly meaningless. So I've come here to the Bank of England to bring them to life. It's a strange looking building. If you look up, you see a beautiful classical facade but here at ground level, it's very different. A blank, forbidding wall without any windows at all. And there's a reason for that. Gold. Lots of it. The building is quite literally a fortress. It's forbidding walls built to keep thieves and robbers at bay. Because the Bank of England is where all the UK's gold reserves are, stacked up in bars in the basement. These days, that's around 310 tonnes of gold or, to use biblical measurements, a little under 10,000 talents. It's an unimaginably vast sum. And so, unless you literally have the wealth of nations at your disposal, 10,000 talents is the sort of money you can only dream of. In contrast, though, 100 denarii is a much more normal sum of money. The denarius was a small silver coin and it was the standard wage for a day's work, which means that 100 denarii was three or four months wages for a normal person, say 10,000 pounds or dollars today. I find putting these numbers in a modern context really helps me to understand what Jesus is saying here, and by extension, what showing FEA case means for me. I think we often assume that Jesus is saying that the things other people do against us the sins I have to forgive are tiny, just small change that we should ignore. But he's not. 100 denarii was a lot of money, particularly when you remember that most of Jesus' original listeners were probably quite poor and disadvantaged. And I don't know about you, but if someone owed me 10,000 pounds, I'd want it back. And it's the same with the things that people have done against us. Those wounds and hurts you carry are real and significant. And if Jesus had just told that part of the story, then the idea of forgiving them just wouldn't make sense. I'm not going to write off a debt of £10,000. Except, if someone had just let me off a debt of a few billion, well, then I might manage it. Have you ever realised how much Jesus has forgiven you? The cross is an unimaginably vast gift. Not just in terms of what we're forgiven, but also in terms of what Jesus then gives us. What Paul describes elsewhere as the riches of his glorious inheritance. When we realise that, and realise that Jesus asks and longs for us to love and forgive whoever it is we're struggling with or hurt by, suddenly it doesn't seem quite so hard after all. 
And we realize that we do have so much that in Christ we can afford to surrender our rights and position. I'm a spiritual billionaire and I can afford to show Epi case gentle forbearance to someone, everyone else. The strange thing though, is that it turns out that one of the primary beneficiaries of my gentle forbearance is me. Because Paul includes it here in Philippians 4 as one of the ingredients that leads to me experiencing God's peace. How does that work? Well, I love the message translation of this verse. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. When we act out of EPA case, we shift our focus from trying to protect our own wants and position to trying to help the other person flourish. We are on their side. And that can be transformative in a relationship, especially when they realize that. When we've made it clear to them, as Paul tells us to do here, that we really do want them to thrive and flourish. There are no perfect relationships. It's inevitable that we will hurt one another. And it might be through something we do or we say, or something we don't do or don't say. But that hurt must be healed if our relationships are going to flourish. And it, it can be quite small things, but if small ways that we hurt each other aren't, aren't dealt with, they build up and the resentment can increase. And it's a, bit, a little bit like a, a drain. You know, a drain can get blocked up with small stones, little bits of gravel. Uh, and if you don't deal with it, if you don't clear the drain, it actually leads to a lot of mess and, and a bad smell. <laughs> and the Bible has a wonderful process for healing hurt. It's a simple process, but it is challenging. Uh, first, we have to talk about the hurt. Second, we have to apologize where we've got it wrong. And third, we have to forgive. And the Bible makes it clear that we are to initiate, actually whether we've been hurt or whether we've hurt our partner. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says it both ways round. In uh, Matthew 5, this is a paraphrase, uh, if you become aware that your brother or sister has a grudge against you. Stop what you're doing. Go, make it right. There's an urgency about it. Uh, and then a little bit later in Matthew 18, Jesus says, uh, if you offend your brother or sister, go and sort it out just between the two of you. So we need to take the initiative, whichever way around it is. And of course, when we're doing it, if we're both doing that, things get sorted out quickly. And we must forgive. And that's true whether the person who's hurt us has apologized or not. I, I grew up with um, uh, parents who really didn't have a good model of um, healing the ways they upset each other. I didn't see a lot of apology and forgiveness. And so I had to learn that when we got married. And. I think one of the most important things I ever learned about forgiveness was that it's not just about my feelings, but it's a choice that we make. And um, I remember absolutely vividly the first time I had to say, I forgive you to Nikki. And I actually had to say it out loud. I found that really difficult to say. But once I'd said it, it was incredible the difference it made. It was like the resentment left. I didn't have that feeling of self-pity going on any longer. And it really is true. Forgiveness sets us free. So forgiveness is not just for our relationships. It's also very important for us, for our well-being. And where there's been deep hurt, often that forgiveness needs to be a process. It may be we need to keep uh, forgiving, even on a daily basis. But as we do so, slowly the, the power of that hurt and the memories will have less and less power over us. 
In our closest relationships, this gentle forbearance does need to be accompanied by honesty. It's not the same as pretending we've not been hurt when we have, or that there's nothing to forgive. And so often as we move forward, we need to help them know how best to love us back. But it does mean being willing to forgive everything that's already happened, and being patient and forbearing when mistakes are repeated in future. And often it also means being honest and willing to admit our mistakes and ask for forgiveness even if that's not fully reciprocated. With those we're less close to though, acting out of EPA case may mean that they never know how much they've wounded or hurt us. And that's okay. Not because those things don't matter, but because we can find healing and restoration and everything we need. Not from asserting our rights against them, but from God, allowing us to forgive them. And that, again, can be healing and transformative in a relationship, but not always. Sometimes, no matter how much love and forbearance we put into a relationship, it's still met with indifference, even hostility, and we're still ignored or treated badly, and there's nothing we can do about it. But even when that happens, there's power in Epie case. I wonder whether when he wrote this, Paul had in mind one of the most amazing examples of it he'd ever seen. He'd been one of the people involved in killing Stephen, the first Christian martyr, watching over the coats of those stoning him and approving of what happened. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Isn't that amazing? Stephen forgiving and praying for God to forgive them, even as they killed him. That's EPA case and on a grand scale. Stephen wasn't trying to say it was all okay. He knew there was something to forgive and he knew how wrong they were. He's pretty forthright in what he says to them earlier in the chapter. But he was able to do it because he also knew where he was going. He knew what he had in Jesus, and he knew that even death and execution could not strip that away. And so, rather than dying in anger and bitterness towards his killers, there's this amazing sense of peace about how his death is described. Falling asleep is an odd way to talk about someone being battered to death by stoning. And yet, I wonder if in this case, it's a good description. Now, thankfully, I've never had to show EPA case like that, or even close. But I do know that there is power in forgiveness and forbearance. And whether it's welcomed with love and thanks or flung back in our face, Paul's promises here are true. That when we let our gentleness, our EPA case, be evident to all, that will flow into us experiencing the peace of God which transcends all understanding as a result. Let's pray. Lord God, you know how hard we find it to forgive and to show forbearance, EPA case, when we're wounded and hurt. Help us to know the vastness of your love for us and the riches of your forgiveness and blessings. And help us to know the power to forgive and forbear, and the peace that flows from it. Amen. Thanks so much for watching. Have you ever considered doing one of our series with your small group? If you do, we have discussion guides, downloadable versions and other resources, all free on our website, burningheart.org. And I would also love to ask you to help us keep our films free for everyone. Could you pay it forward and help us make our next series, either by praying or giving. Thanks so much.